This is Optimal Health Daily, episode 1699, Common Mistakes When Tracking Macros, by Rachel Gregory of metflexlife.com. And I'm your host and narrator, Dr. Neil Malik. Hey there, happy middle of the week Wednesday, and welcome back to Optimal Health Daily, where I read to you from popular health and fitness blogs, and always with a bit of my commentary at the end. Now today is Wednesday, and like I do every Wednesday, I like to give you a little bit of inspiration. So here we go. Quote, If we have never been amazed by the very fact that we exist, we are squandering the greatest fact of all. Will Durant. All right, now that we're in the right positive frame of mind, let's get right to today's post and start optimizing your life. Common Mistakes When Tracking Macros by Rachel Gregory of metflexlife.com. We've chatted before about tracking macros and why it can be beneficial in helping you reach your goals. Quick recap on why tracking your food can be helpful. It creates structure, direction, and ultimately more control. It makes you aware of your eating habits and how those habits affect your results. It teaches you energy and macronutrient contents of the foods you're eating and the portion sizes. It helps you gain awareness of mindless eating. And it teaches you how to structure your diet for health and performance. And of course, there's lots more. But let's chat about some of the common mistakes that occur when tracking that could be holding you back from reaching your goals. Number one, using generic measurements. The issue with generic measurements is that they are very subjective. A medium avocado to you could look like a large avocado to me. Same goes for other vegetables, fruits, and so on. Did you know avocados can range anywhere from three to eight and a half ounces without the seed and skin. If we do the math, that's a range of anywhere from 130 to 400 calories. When tracking, it's best to remove the subjective part as much as possible and base your info on objective data. Instead of logging half a medium avocado, grab a food scale and measure it out in grams or ounces. Number two, measuring volume instead of weight. I remember when I used to bake with my grandmother as a kid. She always reminded me to be very gentle when scooping the flour into the measuring cup and not packing it down. Why? Because if you're not careful, you're going to get a lot more than you think you're getting. Same goes for when you're using measuring cups or spoons to scoop out things like protein powder, almond flour, peanut butter, and so on. Not only could you be packing the contents down more, but it's super easy to overfill or underfill without even realizing it. Plus, all measuring spoons and cups are manufactured differently, which means they all vary slightly in their capacity. Again, your best bet is to invest in a food scale. Once you get it, test out what one scoop of your protein powder or one tablespoon of peanut butter actually weighs. I think you're going to be really surprised. Oh, and weighing instead of using multiple spoons and cups means less dishes to wash. It's a win-win situation, folks. Number three, eyeballing portion sizes instead of weighing. This one pretty much goes hand in hand with number two. Obviously, weighing your food all the time is not practical, especially if you're eating at a restaurant or going over to a friend's house for dinner. But this is where that awareness thing I always talk about comes into play. Taking the extra two seconds to pull out your food scale when you're at home and measuring that handful of almonds or the six ounces of steak is gonna teach you exactly what certain quantities of certain foods look like. So when you do go out to dinner or over to your friend's house for a snack, you'll be able to eyeball your portion sizes much more accurately. Number four, weighing raw and logging cooked weight. I get this question all the time. Should I weigh my food raw or cooked? The simplest answer is that weighing your food raw will always be more accurate because when we cook food, it can either lose moisture think when cooking meat and veggies, or gain moisture, like when we cook rice and oatmeal. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to remember is to just be consistent. So if you normally log something in raw weight in your tracker, make sure you're actually consuming the raw weight and not the cooked weight. Quick example. A good rule of thumb is that meat tends to lose approximately 25% of its weight once cooked. So if you grill six ounces of chicken breast, it will typically end up weighing around four and a half ounces after it's cooked. If you're weighing once it's cooked, then six ounces of grilled chicken will actually be eight ounces of raw chicken. 
Make sense? My recommendation would be, if you can, try to weigh your food raw and log it raw as it tends to be the most accurate. But as mentioned earlier, what matters most is that you're staying consistent with your logging method. So if you'd rather log it cooked, just make sure you're searching and selecting the cooked option in your tracking app. Number five, forgetting to track licks, nibbles, and bites. It may not seem like it makes a difference in the moment, but having a few extra macadamia nuts in your afternoon snack or eating a tiny scoop of nut butter late at night will add up. Remember, calories don't just reset overnight. If you're taking an extra nibble here and a few extra bites there every day, that will add up over the course of the week and the month. Be honest with yourself. If you're not logging these little licks, nibbles, and bites throughout the day and struggling to see the results you want, you're only cheating yourself. It's harsh, but it's reality. And number six, playing macros Tetris. All of my clients know that I'm a stickler when it comes to pre-planning your meals for the day ahead of time. The reason is, if you don't go into your day with a plan for the foods and meals you're gonna eat, you're just setting yourself up for a more stressful time trying to figure out what to eat and what fits within your daily macro goals. I say this all the time. Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Again, harsh but true. If you're constantly playing macro Tetris at the end of the day, nine out of 10 times, you're gonna miss your marks. Maybe it works some days, but I promise the burnout will come on real quick. While you're sitting on the couch watching TV and winding down for the night, take the extra five minutes to pre-plan the following day in your tracker. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just have some sort of plan ready to go. Even just planning 80% of your day ahead of time is going to make a huge difference, I promise. I hope this was helpful. Remember, macro and calorie tracking is never going to be perfect, but it's a great way to increase awareness around your eating habits, portion sizes, and create more objective data to work with as you continue to move closer to your goals. You just listened to the post titled Common Mistakes When Tracking Macros by Rachel Gregory of metflexlife.com. Right now, hiring is challenging. It's time for a hiring partner that can help you rise to the challenge. That's Indeed. Indeed partners with you on every step of the hiring process. Find great talent through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. I love that Indeed makes hiring easy. Indeed helps star applicants shine with over 135 assessment tests from cooking to coding. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash health. Offer valid through April 30th. Go to indeed.com slash health to claim your $75 credit before April 30th. Indeed.com slash health. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Dr. Neil here for my commentary. When I used to be a health educator for an adult weight management program, I would encourage all of my patients to buy a food scale and some measuring cups. I would always remind them that they don't have to use these tools forever, but simply using them for a while is usually enough to get experience with how much food one serving is. Now, this wasn't an easy sell, and not everyone followed my advice. So, I would provide them with some other helpful ways to guesstimate food portions. For example, if you imagine a baseball, that represents about one cup of something. It also happens to represent a medium-sized piece of fruit, like an apple or orange. Now, if you've never held a baseball before, it could be difficult to imagine how large one is. So, another, even less precise way to guesstimate one cup or one medium-sized apple or orange would be to make a fist. That would be roughly one cup. So if you're walking around the grocery store and you want to know if you're purchasing a medium-sized apple, let's say, hold your fist up to it. If the apple is about the size of your fist, then it's a medium-sized apple. Here's another example. The first joint of your index finger represents about one teaspoon. Your thumb 
is equal to about one tablespoon. The palm of your hand would be about three ounces of chicken, steak, a hamburger patty, tofu, some sort of protein. You get the idea. Again, these are rough guesstimates, so it would still be best to invest in a food scale and some measuring cups if you can. But in the meantime, you can always use these to get an idea of portion sizes. All right, that'll do it for another edition of Optimal Health Daily. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you back here tomorrow where your optimal life awaits.